Thank Farzad, Multiversal Journeys, Foundational Questions, which uh, funds my research and this talk, and uh, my collaborators, Noah Graham, Chris Huster, and Mitch Benning. So you think about time travel, you say, I'm going to have a time machine. It's like a car. You know, we're going into the future, but then you make this big turn, and the car goes back into the past, and, and now we're traveling backward in time, and this is the wrong model. Uh, so you should put from your head any idea of uh, uh, getting in a machine that somehow moves through space-time in the wrong direction. There's nothing like that. But there are some ideas, uh, some ideas that go back to the theory of relativity that uh, might make time travel possible, and that's the majority of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so let me just start by making a simple diagram. Uh, this is called a space-time diagram, and it's just a graph, except that uh, we put time on this axis, so uh, now it's 2 o'clock or so, 2.30, and uh, here we are in Cambridge. So places which are in the same place uh, are represented by lines like this. So if we just all stayed here in Cambridge for four hours, we would sit right on here on this line. Eventually it would be 6 o'clock. If instead we got in a car, we drove to Manhattan, we would go along this line. Uh, and uh, in about four hours, we'd be in Manhattan. If instead we went to Manhattan at the speed of light, we'd be there very fast. We go along this line, which is nearly horizontal. So this diagram puts the space and time together, but it puts them together at the wrong scale, because the important thing here is the speed of light. The speed of light is the <coughs> conversion factor that naturally relates space and time. So we should change the diagram uh, so that the scale is right. So now here's 230 and 238. Here's the Earth. Here's the Sun. If we went at the speed of light towards the Sun, we'd get there in about eight minutes. and uh, so this line is going at the speed of light. This line is going out some other direction at the speed of light, say towards Mars. And once again, if we stay here, uh, we just go upward in this picture. Uh, of course, there are other dimensions to go in. Instead of going uh, this way or that way, we could go this way or uh, some other directions that are hard to show here because I'm out of dimensions. But uh, let's just concentrate on two. If I put in another dimension, we get a cone. So this circle here is to represent that this is a cone consisting of all these directions. Should we go at the speed of light that way, or that way, or that way, or that way, or any way that you want to go. And this is just a picture. It's just a way of writing a picture showing space and time on the same footing. And Newton could have drawn this picture. Um, the important thing, the novel feature here, due to Einstein, is special relativity in which space and time are combined into one thing, <coughs> space-time. There's some relation between them. And that's the thing that enables us to do something uh, that you might call travel in time. At least travel in time. Uh, so, uh, so what Einstein discovered was that nothing could go faster than light. So if we draw this cone, these are the ways that you could go in green. And at every moment, you should be bounded by a little cone like that. You have to stay inside and travel into the future. This means going slowly. This means going faster. This means going faster than light, and you can't do it. That's not allowed, and this means going backward in time, because we're going down towards the negative time direction. You can't do that either. So from the special relativity point of view, these things are actually the same. Faster than light, backward in time, they're the same. The point is we're outside of this light cone. <coughs> we should be restricted to stay on in the inside of that light cone. So that's, uh, that's what we know from special relativity from 1905. Uh, but what about time travel to the future? Well, let's start easy. Time travel to the future is very easy. You're doing it now. Right? You've been here uh, for an hour and some, and we've gone an hour into the future. Oh, that wasn't what you meant. You had some other idea of time travel into the future. So time travel into the future means you go to the same place in space and time as you go anyway, but you take less time. You're not as bored when you get there. <laughs> so if you go to sleep now, and you wake up in an hour when the lecture's done, then you've traveled in time an hour into the future. 
Well, not really. I mean, you know, you've slept, but from your point of view, not much time has passed. That's time travel into the future. And we can improve on the plan of going to sleep by doing this by traveling rapidly through space. So if you get in a spaceship and you travel out towards the direction of the sun, let's say, at nearly the speed of light, and then you turn around, you come back, maybe your clock, which you set at 2.30 when you left, now only reads 2.31. I stay here in this lecture hall for eight minutes, my clock reads 2.38. And it's not just your clock. This isn't like your clock is playing you false because you didn't change the batteries in your watch or something. It really is time. Only one minute of time, if you travel at the right speed close to the speed of light, has elapsed. You're one minute older, you've thought about things for one minute, your clock has ticked off one minute. Uh, that's time travel into the future. Not very much time passes, you end up in the future. So there's no problem there at all. Uh, and you can test this. So, uh, you know, the Earth is rotating, turns towards the east. So if you get in a plane and you travel around over the surface of the Earth eastward, then you're going faster than a person who just sits at one plate, say, over here in Cambridge. Uh, you're going quicker. The pilot of this plane ages less. Time passes more slowly for him. He moves a little bit into the future. On the other hand, if you fly west, then you're flying counter to the rotation of the Earth. You're going around in this circle more slowly. So you age a little bit more. Everybody else is traveling into the future a little bit faster than you are. And this can be measured. It's about a microsecond that you gain or lose by making one loop around the Earth at the speed of an airplane. Uh, but you can measure it by putting an accurate clock on an airplane, and this has been done. So this is not exotic. Uh, it's straightforward, well understood. If there's any question about it, it's no problem in physics, but of course the engineering is hard. So if you say, oh great, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm very sick and I wish to go into the future and maybe a hundred years from now people have uh, found the cure for my disease. I'll just get in a spaceship and I'll go on the speed of light nearly for 50 years and I'll turn around and I'll come back at the speed of light for 50 years. And then I will have only aged a few days so I won't have gotten any sicker and when I get back to Earth maybe doctors will have cured my disease. Great plan, nice reason to travel into the future. Unfortunately, um, there's a little problem of engineering of building this spaceship that goes nearly at the speed of light. On the other hand, uh, for uh, subatomic particles, it's easy. We accelerate them to very, very close to the speed of light. In accelerators, and you can measure this effect. If you take a particle which is very short-lived, um, uh, it doesn't last for a long time, but you get it moving very quickly, that time is stretched out because not much time passes for it, and so it lives for a longer period of time. So that's the future. But what you really wanted was backward time travel. I'm going to go back into the past. And the idea where you might do this is general relativity, as Larry told you about in much more detail than I will. Um, general relativity says that matter and energy change the shape of space-time. The structure of space-time is changed by the presence of matter and by the motions of matter. And one of the things that happens in this change is that these light cones can, t can change. They can point in different directions, and since they mark out the places of space-time that you can go from the places that you can't go, you can travel to parts of space-time that you couldn't otherwise reach. Once again, we're not talking about engineering, we're talking about what the physical laws will allow. So here's a sort of a schematic of what we're going to do. We start out down here. Every point has associated one of these cones about it. This, again, are different points in space. This is time, the normal sense of time. If we're in here, we can only go on any path that stays in the interior of this cone. But now, we've built some big machine that takes very massive objects, black holes or something, moves them very rapidly, does some kind of thing. Uh, and because of this, we curve space. We change the shape of space and we change the angle of these light cones so that gradually, as this machine gets somehow revved up, these light cones tip over until they're now pointing like this. So the set of directions you can go is different now. Here you are in the middle. You could go anywhere on in the interior of this cone, just like usual. You can't travel faster than light because light travels at the edge of the cone. So you're still inside the cone. However, from a global point of view, this line goes backward in time. It goes towards earlier times. And now you could go through all these cones one at a time going backward in time as you go, getting earlier and earlier. And if this thing were somehow wrapped around in a big circle, maybe, you could go around in a big loop 
always getting earlier and earlier and earlier, eventually coming back maybe to here, which is the same place that you started out at an earlier time. And that would really be backward time travel. So that's the thing that you want to be able to do. And the question is, is it possible? Uh, so here's the right model of time travel uh, accomplished by means of general relativity. It's not like a special car that is able to go into the past. It's like a special tunnel that leads into the past. And you know the way that tunnels work is that first you dig the tunnel, and then you drive through it. You can't drive through the tunnel which has not been dug. And this is no different here. You can't go back in time, even if we could build a time machine. You cannot go back in time before the machine was built. For roughly the same reason that you can't go over a bridge that hasn't been constructed, or through a tunnel that hasn't been dug. First, the arrangement is there. So a time travel, a time machine is a funny name. I mean, we use this in the literature, but it's not exactly a machine. It's not like a car that goes back in time by means of you pulling some lever or something. It's more like a road, a tunnel that leads backward in time. And this tunnel is set up somehow, maybe, by moving very large amounts of matter and energy of just the right kind in just the right way. And the question then is, can you do it? What's the right way? Uh, so this is uh, the uh, physicist's conception of a tunnel. Uh, anyway, my drawing of a wormhole. To make a wormhole, you take some space over here and some space over here. Somehow you glue them together so that if you travel in here, you go and come out over there in a different place in space without having gone through the space in between. Um, so uh, you, uh, you can imagine that space-time is made of rubber. And you take a piece of the rubber and you cut it out, sort of stretch it over here, take a piece of rubber from over there, cut it out, stick these together. And that connects together these two places, which could be maybe very, very distant. But the neck, this part here, which connects them together, might be very short. So by going a small distance in here, you could come out in space very far away. So this is great for uh, rapid travel to distant stars. Uh, so it's faster than light travel. You could also arrange it to have time travel by taking these pieces of space time that you took out and stuck together to be at different times. So uh, you go in here, it's Tuesday, and you come out here, it's Monday, because Monday's been uh, glued to Tuesday uh, by means of this wormhole. So there's no question that if you could build these wormholes, and if the wormholes would stay around, and allow you to travel through without uh, any bad things happening on the way, uh, that would certainly be sufficient for time travel. It's not necessary to have wormholes to have time travel. There's other ideas, other ways like that tilting over the light cones, but this certainly works. Uh, so here's the question. The whole point of the issue is, can this be done? Is it possible to... Uh, to create this shape of matter, this shape of space-time, can we find a way to do it? So uh, Larry talked about Einstein's equations. Uh, matter and energy produce some shape of space-time. The existence of the matter of a certain sort causes space-time to assume a certain shape. And we just solve this in reverse. You see, I have a space-time I want. Um, we put this into Einstein's equations from the other side. Uh, we put the space-time that we want on uh, the left-hand side, and out comes the matter and energy that are needed to create the space-time on the right-hand side. And the interesting thing is this always works. There's no problem as far as general relativity is concerned in taking this equation and solving it in the other direction. So given a space-time that you like, you can always produce it if you have the correct matter and energy. And Einstein's equations tell you what is the correct matter and energy, what you need to get done the job that you want to do. So if you want to make a wormhole, you want to go faster than light, you want to go backward in time, all these things can be done as far as general relativity is concerned. General relativity says nothing about them except just telling you what the ingredients are. But when you solve these equations and you find out what the ingredients are, you discover that all these ingredients have a strange property. You need to have exotic things that have negative mass, negative energy. And that's the problem, to know whether those things exist or not. You can see, in the case of a wormhole, I can explain to you what the negative energy is for. 
Um, if you go into a wormhole, here's somebody coming in to the wormhole from the top, goes through the wormhole somehow, comes out going this way. This guy comes in from the bottom, he comes out going that way. Lots of different people come into this wormhole from different directions, coming together, travel through the neck of the wormhole, and now they're going apart. Well, that's not the usual way gravity works. Usually gravity pulls things together. So normally, if things are falling together, then gravity makes them fall together faster and faster. It doesn't take them when they're falling together and make them turn around and go apart. So that's why we need the negative mass. We need gravitational repulsion to make these things go out. I cannot explain to you why this is true for any way to make a time machine, but it is. Uh, if you try to figure out taking space-time like ours, as far as we know, that has a normal structure of time, and building a time machine, or again, by machine, I mean some kind of an arrangement that allows a path that ends up back in the past. To make that arrangement, you've got to have this negative energy. Um, so what is this negative mass that we need for this thing? Well, the first thing you're going to think is it's antimatter, because uh, that sounds like matter, but the other way around. Uh, but it's not antimatter, because you know, if you put antimatter and matter together, what you get is everything converged to energy, a big explosion. Uh, if you put negative energy and positive energy together, well, you'd have no energy at all. So that would give you potentially nothing. The total amount of energy would be zero, because you'd be adding a negative number and a positive number. So you would not have a big explosion. So it's not antimatter. Also, you know that antimatter has regular gravity. If you drop a positron, it falls the same way as an electron. Um, so is there such a thing? Does this negative matter, this negative energy that we need, does it exist at all? Well, if you just took regular classical matter and energy, the answer would be no. So the world is made up of things. Right, uh, you know, particles. They have positive mass, fields, various kinds of energy. You know, when you put energy into a battery, charge it up. Uh, if you're putting positive energy in, you don't charge up your battery with negative energy. But it turns out uh, that in quantum mechanics, the answer is yes. Um, for the reason that uh, I cross explain. Uh, for example, in the Casimir effect. You take metal plates, parallel metal plates, very close together, uncharged, and in here you get a region of negative energy. And the reason you have a region of negative energy there is that it's the, it's the vacuum, there's nothing there, but it has all these virtual particles in it. And the virtual particles in here are restricted, they are not quite the same as the ones which are outside or the, the excitations of the field, however you say it. This is a real phenomenon. It can be observed, although we can't observe this energy density. There is a force between these plates. They want to be pulled together by the existence of this negative energy. And the reason is that as you move the plates closer and closer together, of course, the volume which has the negative energy in it is less. But the amount by which the energy is negative becomes more, and that's more important. So the amount of negative energy increases. The amount of energy becomes more negative as the plates go together. And therefore, there's a force. That's the usual way that forces work. If you take a spring, you stretch it out, it has positive energy. If I let it go together, it has less positive energy. So there's less energy. And that's why there's a force pulling the spring together. Here, it's negative. Let the plates go together. The negative energy is even more negative. So there's a force that pulls them inward. And uh, that force can be measured and has been measured and agrees with the calculations of quantum mechanics. So here's the out, the trick that might enable you to have time travel. Because we need negative energy, but on the other hand, we have negative energy. So maybe it's OK. Uh, this system doesn't work very well, though, because it has a problem. In here is a very tiny amount of negative energy uh, in the electromagnetic field between these plates. And then there's these massive metal plates. And the mass of the plates is much larger than the effect of the energy, small amount of negative energy, which is in here. So this doesn't work. Now, if you could have an isolated negative mass object, that would do the job. So if you could somehow take this negative stuff in here and pull it apart, take it out from between the plates and make it into a ball and stick it out in space somewhere, that would certainly do the job. That would be good for time travel, but you should be glad that there are no isolated negative mass objects. because 
We had this equation in the other direction before. Negative energy plus positive energy could go to nothing. Well, that means nothing could go to negative energy plus positive energy. But there's a lot of nothing around. And um, if negative energy and positive energy could appear spontaneously out of nothing, then the vacuum would explode. And uh, even things which are not the vacuum would explode. Uh, what keeps the vacuum stable is that there's nowhere down to go. What keeps particles stable is that they have nothing to decay into. If they can decay into something else, and has less energy, they will. So um, you should be glad that we don't have these uh, you know, negative mass particles, like you could imagine protons or stars or something, whose mass would be negative. We don't have those. And that's good uh, for us to stay alive, but it's not good for time travel. So the question that we've got to ask is, is there any sufficient arrangement of negative energy? Can we use, we can't use this isolated negative mass thing because it doesn't exist. Can we take this thing and somehow overcome this problem? Is there a way to get the amount of negative energy that we need in the right way, in the right place, the right kind to do the job? And uh, the answer is probably not. I didn't come into this field uh, with the idea that I hated time travel and I wanted to show everybody that time travel was no good. In fact, I thought time travel would be fun. Um, I didn't uh, you know, have any special goal for time travel, but I thought it would be interesting. If it was possible, it would certainly be a big challenge to the laws of physics, because as I'm sure you know, once you have time travel, you face a great deal of paradoxes. These paradoxes are not alleviated by anything in physics that we know, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And so it would be a big puzzle, and physicists love puzzles, because when we have a puzzle, we can try to solve the puzzle and make progress, and we think we understand things, we know what to do next. So I thought it would be great to have time travel, and I actually tried to put together some things, and say, well, you know, what if I did something different and I arranged my plates in a different way or I made holes in the plates so that we could travel through the negative energy part but we wouldn't have to run into the plate because we could sneak out through the hole. And all these things didn't work. Uh, so after a while, I said, well, uh, maybe there's a reason that none of these things work uh, and uh, time travel is impossible. So here's the idea of how you go about proving time travel is impossible. There are two parts. You want to prove some theorem in general relativity. You take some premise and you get to some conclusion. So for example, a theorem of general relativity would be if there's no negative energy, there would be no time travel, no faster than light travel, no wormholes. So once you've proved this theorem that gets some premise about matter into a conclusion about time travel, you then prove the premise using quantum mechanics. You say even in quantum mechanics, this premise holds true, and therefore the conclusion holds true, and so now I've proved that uh, whatever it is that time travel is impossible. Uh, but this premise, no negative energy, is too strong. Uh, it's, it's a perfectly nice premise. This is a correct theorem of general relativity that's been known for a while. Um, but the problem with this is it isn't true. Because we know from the Cassiter effect that there is negative energy. So the premise is effective, but since it doesn't hold, it's no good. So with this premise, step one is fine, and step two is no good. Uh, so to improve matters, we need to come up with some new premise. That's the idea. And here's my new premise. All right, the new premise is the self-consistent achronal average null energy condition. But what the heck is that? I'm not going to tell you. Because there's a limit to how much you can stick in a one-hour talk. Um, it is a version of this idea of no negative energy that says that negative energy is al allowed, but certain kinds of averages of the negative mm -hmm. energy are not allowed. So if I, this null means that I take a null geodesic, the path that a light ray would travel on, and I average along it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details. This premise works as before, in the sense that if this condition is true, then time travel is ruled out. So this part we know. Uh, furthermore, it has an advantage over the stronger premise of having no negative energy at all. That it isn't, it's without known violations. So the first thing to do when you want to prove something is to have it not be obviously false. So on the grounds that it's easier to prove things that don't have counterexamples, uh, this is my proposal. Um, and it holds in certain cases. Um, it holds, for example, in flat space, where you don't take into account any curvature produced by any matter. You just do your quantum mechanics in flat space. 
Uh, now, you might say, but that's of no interest, because, of course, it was curved space that was going to be of interest anyway. You wanted to curve up space in a time machine, so who cares what can or can't be done in flat space? And that would be right. Uh, so we've made some progress, but this general proof is not done. Um, nevertheless, I think that that's true, um, which is why I've been working on this conjecture. Uh, so I think it's correct that, uh, that this thing is going to hold, and that we are going to be able to do step two from the slide before, where we prove this in quantum mechanics. <coughs> and that will then rule out time travel, at least this approach to time travel. Um, now, there's lots of caveats, and here's one. What I've been talking about today is called semi-classical gravity. Semi-classical because gravity we treat classically, but the matter and the energy that provide the sources to gravity we treat quantum mechanically. Now, why are we doing this? On the one hand, we, treat, we say, if we did, treat everything classically, there would be no negative energy, classical general relativity, there would be no time. So that didn't give me a very interesting answer. Now I want to go to treating the matter quantum mechanically so I can have things like the Casimir effect. Then maybe something interesting will happen. And now you say, fine. Well, so you're treating the matter quantum mechanically. You should treat the gravity quantum mechanically, too, in order to be consistent. If we knew how to do it, we would. So the point is, this is the best you can do. Uh, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. Uh, maybe string theory is it, maybe not. Um, I won't express an opinion on that. Uh, so in principle, uh, maybe quantum gravity doesn't have this restriction. But of course, quantum gravity you know, should be the theory that only matters for very, very high energy, dense, tiny things. And so this semi-classical idea should be good for large systems, in particular big you know, time machines. Um, so I don't know. My belief is that quantum gravity is going to be the same. But um, you're free to believe something completely different, because we don't have the theory of quantum gravity. And I don't even know. I don't know if string theorists know, and I certainly don't know, whether there's any difference in string theory, if that's the right theory, uh, on this kind of subject. I would suspect not, but I'm not certain. All right. Um, let me go on to some other related things. In particular, I think I should say something about Professor Ron Millett from the University of Connecticut. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard him. Um, he says he's got to build a time machine. He has a system which is going to produce time travel with light. He's going to take uh, laser beams. I have one here. Uh, he's going to make them circulate around, and that's going to produce time travel. But wait, ordinary light doesn't have negative energy. Ordinary light has positive energy. That's why I have to put batteries in these. Um, so Millet must be wrong. Um, and uh, we claim to know why Millet is wrong. Um, so I wrote a paper with Alan Everett, my colleague at Tufts, uh, which was published in Foundation of Physics Letters. And if you want to see this paper, you can. Just look for all of them and Everett on the net. Um, and we think we've found out, we have pointed out where the flaw was um, in what Millet was trying to do. And, you know, that's fine. Anybody can make a mistake. Scientists make mistakes all the time. They might be telling you things right today that are wrong. Um, but things are a little worse than that uh, with this uh, proposal because He's not just talking about the physics of the time machine. He's talking about the engineering of the time machine. He's <coughs> going to start building it. I now began to plan how I might turn my theory into practical reality. It was time to build an experimental time machine. These words are taken from Professor Millet's book. Um, now he's talking about engineering. He's actually going to build this thing. He wants to start now with some preliminary experiments at the University of Connecticut to build this time machine. He says, the 21st century is the century of time travel. Let's get to work. Well, this is very hard. And the reason is that gravity is very weak. I mean, you know, it's easy to observe gravity, right? Things fall. But that's the entire Earth. The gravity of the entire Earth holds us down here to the floor and stuff. But the Earth is very big. You can measure the gravity of a little piece of metal in the laboratory. This is this experiment of weighing the Earth. Um, but now we're talking not just the gravity of a heavy piece of metal, we're talking about the gravity from the mass equivalent of the energy in the light beam. It's very, very small, the energy, the mass of in the light beam. The gravitational effect is tinier still. 
So whatever you think about the physics of this, the engineering of it is very difficult. And the <coughs> just to show that this engineering is not around the corner, um, did a little calculation. Millet proposes a warm-up experiment. Um, his machine for going back in time consists of lasers circulating around like this in a square. These would be mirrors. Um, and he says the first thing we're going to do before we test out time travel is we're going to test out frame dragging. Now, frame dragging is a real process predicted by general relativity in which when things are turning, they tend to make other things which are next to them rotate also. So for example, here's the Earth. The Earth is rotating once a day. Uh, and if you put a satellite in orbit around the Earth, then a gyroscope in that satellite will very slowly rotate because of a coupling between the rotation of the Earth and the axis of the satellite. And this was just measured by this satellite called Gravity Probe B. It took almost a billion dollars and about 40 years to get built. And uh, they did a beautiful experiment, and they measured the rotation about 11 millionths of a degree. The experiment ran for one year. The gyroscope was rotated by 11 millionths of a degree, and because these guys are very smart, had a lot of very high technology going for them, they were able to measure this tiny angle. So I took the equation from uh, Professor Millet's book, the setup he proposes, which is a big stack of 40,000 lasers, each of one with a laser power of 10 watts. <clears throat> and I put in the numbers, and I got a millionth of a degree of rotation in 60 quadrillion years. So. If I were funding this, I would not really want to give them a lot of money to do this experiment because um, 40 quadri 60 quadrillion years is a long time to it. Um, so the moral of this story uh, is the difference between physics and engineering. If tomorrow some physicist comes up to you and you tell him about this talk, he says, well, Professor Allen was wrong because I've been thinking about this and I have a different theory. And I understand how it's possible to get away from these problems, these restrictions on negative energy. It really is possible, theoretically, under the laws of physics, to go backward in time. Well, maybe the guy is right, because I could have made a mistake. Even if I told you that I'd completed this proof that I'm working on, I could still have made a mistake. But if a guy comes and says, I'm going to build a time machine in my laboratory tomorrow, you should hold on to your own. <laughs> All right. Let me move on from time travel in relativity to some other ideas that have been proposed about how we might go backward in time not using relativity. Uh, one is called barrier penetration. One is using quantum mechanical correlations. And uh, let me say a few things about these ideas, both of which I think do not work. Uh, so what's uh, barrier penetration. <clears throat> if you have light and you have a very thin barrier, some material that uh, light cannot travel through, but it's thin, a little bit of light will go through, and this is referred to as tunneling. If you get the wrapper from your bag of potato chips, it's silvery because it's coated with a very thin film of metal. And if you take that outside and you look up at the sun, you'll see you can see through. And this is exactly this phenomenon. A little bit of the light goes through because even though there's a metal film, and metal reflects light. The film is very thin. And the claim is made that if you send a pulse in here, the signal will leave this barrier before it goes in. Backward in time communication. So for example, if this pulse would enter here at 12 o'clock, it would come out at 11.59. I'm exaggerating enormously by calling this difference a minute, but just for the sake of discussion. Uh, so what's really going on here? Of course, if this were true, then you know, I could put another barrier, and it would come out of that one at 11.58, and then I could send signals backward in time and uh, you know, tell my friends uh, which socks they should buy yesterday. Uh, but this doesn't work. Uh, here's what's really going on. A pulse is not infinitely sharp. It is not a single moment of light. It has some shape. The light <coughs> turns on, builds up for a while, comes down again. Here's the peak of the pulse. This pulse is traveling in here. Sure enough, the peak of this pulse goes in at about noon, and the peak of the pulse which comes out comes out at 11.59, just as claimed. But on the other hand, the leading edge of the pulse, the very first moment at which any of the light goes into the barrier, is still earlier. 
So this is after that. And uh, what's happening is that the stuff that comes out when I drew in magenta here is really related only to what went in right at the beginning. It doesn't know anything about the stuff that comes in there. The way that this type of barrier works is it's sort of like a gate. The light comes in, it lets the first little bit through, then the gate closes, the rest of the stuff doesn't go in. So yes, this came out at 1159, this went in at 12 o'clock, but that doesn't matter at all. What matters is when this went in, this went in earlier, so this does not in fact produce any communication backward in time. So, uh, that's not going to do it. Let's turn to another plan. Um, quantum correlations. Um, so I'll try in the not very long to give you at least a little flavor of what this idea is about. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is a complicated business, but um, maybe to give some idea about it. So we're talking about polarized light. Light is made of photons, little packets of light. And if you have a light bulb, uh, like what's in there, but not like what's in here, perhaps. Um, it emits photons which have random polarization. And I now could take a piece of polarizing film, like in your sunglasses, and um, it will let through some of these photons and not others. And all the ones that go through will now have vertical polarization. What does this mean? Light is an electromagnetic wave. It's got an electric field. As the light is traveling, the electric field points first up, then down, then up, then down. Uh, that's vertical polarization. If it points first to the right and to the left, that would be horizontal. Um, so this is a property of light. And uh, if I have one of these polarizers that uh, is vertically oriented, then the, some photons will go through. They are vertically polarized. If I have another vertical one, the same photons will go through. Now if I have a horizontal one, they stop. Because these are all vertical ones, they don't go through this one. It's pointed at 90 degrees. If I have an intermediate uh, uh, angle there, then some will go through and not others. All right. Now I tell you that there's a kind of quantum mechanical black box, which is capable of emitting two photons, one this way and one that way. These photons are correlated. They don't have any definite polarization, but their polarizations are the same. So if I take my two polarizers and I set them up vertically, then either both these photons will go through. Sometimes as I trigger this box over and over again, I send up pairs of photons. Uh, some pairs will go through, some pairs will not go through, but in all, every case, either they both go or they don't. And similarly, if I set them horizontally, it's the same thing as before. Either they both go through or they don't. If I set them the opposite way, here's a vertical one, here's a horizontal one, then we get the opposite result. Either the photons are emitted in pairs, one always stops, one always goes through. And the intermediate uh, settings give intermediate results, this one. They're not exactly at right angles, so now sometimes we'll get both, sometimes we'll get neither. Uh, how can this happen? How do we arrange matters? What's going on in the black box? What does it send out in these photons to make this possible? So let's think of a few ideas uh, that might go into this. Well, one idea that's been the simplest one is we'll just emit the polarization at random, but it's always the same. So this block says that at this moment emitted two photons, and they're both vertically polarized. This does not work. Because they come to this one at an angle. Let's say we turn this angle in between, so there's a 50% chance to go through. Well, sometimes this one goes through, sometimes that one goes through. That's not the story I told you. I said there's supposed to be a perfect correlation. Either one should go through, either both should go through, or neither, always. Not sometimes one, not, then some, not the other. So this idea does not explain what the black box does. Uh, so here's another plan. They make a whole agreement between them at the time that they leave the black box. They have a list of instructions. If the polarizer is vertical, I'm going to go. If it's horizontal, I'm not. If it's 45 degrees, I'm not. They agree. They have the same set of instructions. Um, so you'd say, OK, now that explains why either they always do or don't. But it turns out this doesn't work either. This is called a hidden variable theory, because attached to these photons is this whole list of extra data. And it turns out not to work. Uh, and this is the content of Bell's inequality, if you know that name. Uh, it is possible to do experiments in which you have many different polarizers set at different angles and things like that that cannot be explained by this type of hidden variable theory in which you have prearrangement. So they decided all in advance what to do. So uh, the next possibility 
that perhaps is motivated by this is some communication. So two photons are emitted. They travel to where the polarizers are. And this guy says, OK, look, I got my polarizer. I see this is a horizontal one. I decided I'm going to go through it. He sends a message to this guy. That guy says, OK, thank you for telling me what your plans are. Uh, I'll go through too, because my polarizer is the same as yours. And our contract is we're supposed to always do the same thing when the things are the same. So of course, this does work. It arranges the thing. It's not foiled by Bell's inequality, but it has to have faster than light communication to work. The reason it has to have faster than light communication is that the tricky experimenter can turn this polarizer at the very last minute. So the photons leave here, and they travel a long distance away. And at the very last minute, this guy flips which way this is going to go. This guy says, OK, it's flipped. And he has to tell that one that that one is about to go through at the same moment that this one is. So this have to communicate faster than light to implement this. And this has led to some people that I think ought to know better to say, oh, well, look, these quantum mechanical particles are communicating faster than light. All we have to do is be just a little clever and we can harness this faster than light communication, and we can send a signal faster than light. Now notice that this system is not allowing you to send any signal. You turn this, and there's a correlation. So what does a correlation mean? It means, say, this guy goes through and that guy goes through. Later on, we could go and get together and say, okay, how did you decide to set your polarizer? How did I decide to set my polarizer? And the times that we set them the same, we'll find the same result. But that's not communication. Communication is somehow I turn mine, and then you have to know how I set mine. And this doesn't provide that. But if you're not careful, you could say, well, OK, that's just because we haven't figured out how to take care of this effect. We haven't figured out how to exploit it well enough. Um, but that's not true. The has just failed. Well, I only have like one more slide, so let's not worry about it. Um, so there's another explanation. All right, lasers everywhere. Another explanation, which is the standard explanation of quantum theory for how this thing works. Um, there's a wave function. Again, this isn't even supposed to be a talk about quantum mechanics, so I'm not going to try to go into any detail. There's a wave function. What the wave function does is it gives probabilities for collective outcomes. That means it tells you what the probability is for two things to happen, not just the probability for this and the probability for that, but the joint probability. And in that wave function, you can say the probability if the polarizers are the same for the outcomes to be the same is equal to 1. Um, and it's not really meaningful to say, well, how is this photon polarized? It's just part of this wave function. Now, if you like quantum mechanics, as it happens I do, um, you say, this is great. This is an elegant idea. This sort of wave function, which even includes things which are very far away. And if you don't like this feature of quantum mechanics, you can say, that's ridiculous. It's against my philosophy. It just doesn't make any sense at all. You're telling me everything that I thought was real is not real. And instead, some completely other set of things are real. It doesn't matter. You can dislike it as much as you want. The point is, this explains experiments. So this idea um, that we just do this standard thing that everybody does in quantum mechanics with these wave functions will explain all these experiments. And this wave function just evolves forward in time in the normal way. It does not permit any type of backward in time communication. It doesn't permit any faster than light communication. So uh, that means that since this describes all the experiments, regardless of what kind of interpretation of quantum mechanics you want, you can have an interpretation of quantum mechanics in which there is some kind of superluminal signal line or something like that. But it will not provide communication. Because communication is not a matter of philosophy. Communication is experimental fact. You set something up, you put in some number somewhere, and the numbers, the data, the signal comes out somewhere else. And uh, different ways of describing quantum mechanics all describe the same thing. This one cannot describe. You can see from this one that it's impossible to uh, have faster than light communication. Even if you prefer some other interpretation, uh, unless you think that quantum mechanics is wrong, of course, you can always think we've made a mistake. I mean, if you like time travel, you could say, well, you know, physicists told me that time travel is impossible, but physicists don't know everything. That's true. We don't know everything. We do make mistakes. Uh, you know, maybe the next theory of physics will allow time travel. It's always possible. But um, in physics as we know it, uh, this does not work. And uh, you need to do those other things. So 
Here's my conclusion, the state of the art. I said I would tell you about time travel. Uh, the question is, this negative energy in quantum mechanics. For time travel, we need negative energy to do time travel in general relativity. There is negative energy in, time in quantum mechanics, but is it sufficient to provide the source for a time machine space-time, or for faster than light travel, or for wormholes, or any of these things? And my answer is probably not. That's the best answer I can give you, uh, because we haven't proved it yet. Uh, time travel to the future, of course, is OK. Uh, that's no problem. We know how to do it, except for engineering. But these other time travel ideas of tunneling through barriers and quantum correlations don't work. So we're stuck with general relativity as our best hope. And uh, this hope seems to be more and more remote. Thank you very much.